You know, back in the day, Isaac Hunter used to say that sometimes uh, the most spiritual thing that we can do uh, is the most practical thing. And the backpack drive is proof positive of that, I think. It's, it's one of those opportunities for us to be the hands and feet of Christ uh, for, for people in need in our community. It's one of those things that we, that we did years ago, uh, kind of stumbled into and we're like, this is awesome. Not just because it makes us feel good, uh, but because it meets a real need in our community. And those types of needs for, uh, for schools and for children and families who are preparing uh, to, to start school, those needs, uh, as important as they've been over the past few years, um, are, are magnified uh, this year. Um, the Backpack Drive, I think, is something that we can do as a church um, to be meaningfully involved, uh, meaningfully the hands and feet uh, in, in the lives of, of children and families in our community. My notes say uh, you should do the Backpack Drive if you want to. Uh, I'm going to say you should do the Backpack Drive if you can't. If you can't do it, that's great. Uh, like, uh, in fact, if you need a backpack, let us know. We're gonna help you out uh, with that. But unless, unless you can't, all of us should. I'm asking every one of us uh, to, to participate in that. Now here's some tips uh, for the backpack drive because the Parker family is veterans in this. If you have young kids, uh, then participate with them in it. Let, let them lead in the selection of backpacks and supplies and all that stuff. It's a great way to both count your blessings uh, and, uh, and acknowledge um, the, the opportunity we have to be a blessing uh, to others as well. If you're in a connect group, team up, get it done. Uh, it's a great way uh, to be involved. And, and if at all possible, be physically involved in, in, the, in the backpack uh, thing. One, it's helpful for us uh, to get a complete backpack. Um, two, it's just that tangible reminder uh, that our actions make a difference in the world. So here's how it'll work. Uh, click on the link below and, uh, and there's a supply list for younger students or older students. And uh, you can get the list and then just go, you know, Target, Walmart, Amazon, whatever, uh, fill the backpack, get, make it complete. And then, uh, and then you can either drop it off uh, at one of our physical uh, locations on a Sunday morning around worship services. You can also uh, drop it off at our offices, uh, which are uh, near downtown, uh, adjacent to the Herndon campus. Uh, you can do that during the week, or if you're just too far away uh, to make sense of, of being able to bring a physical backpack uh, to drop off, uh, you can text backpack uh, to the number you see on the screen, uh, and that'll give you instructions on how to make a financial contribution, uh, and then we'll send someone out uh, to get the supplies on, on your behalf and make sure that we have that backpack. Uh, represented, and then let's just let's do this. Uh, let's let's get it done. Get as many backpacks as we can, uh, and make a definitive statement of God's uh, care um, for for even the little things in our lives uh, that that are a big deal um, for for people who don't have them. And by the way, welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here and be, being a part of this uh, worship service today. My name is John Parker. Uh, I'm your host today, but I'm also available if there's anything I can do uh, to help you connect in next steps uh, here at Summit. I'd love to make myself available to you in that. If you're a guest with us today, uh, welcome to you. And we're so glad that you're here. However you made it into this service, uh, we're glad that you're participating in it. Uh, if, you, uh, if you would like, uh, we'd love for you to introduce yourself to us just so we can properly welcome you to Summit. Uh, you can click on the I am new link in the description below and just let us know who you are. And again, we'll in non-creepy ways, uh, make sure to welcome you uh, to Summit and make ourselves available to be assist of assistance to you in any way that we can. Also, if you're new and you're like, am I allowed to participate in the backpack thing? Absolutely, you're, you're, you're not required to, no pressure, uh, but we'd love for you to participate in that as well. This week, uh, we're continuing in our flyby uh, look into Paul's letter to, first, uh, to, to the Corinthians in, in, in First Corinthians. So we're, we've been spending the year looking at the early church, first through the lens of Acts uh, and, and understanding the events of the early church, and then through Paul's letters to understand the challenges of the early church. And in particular, in First Corinthians, we're understanding that the church was full of distraction. And Paul gets in there and is like addressing the distraction after distraction, and what it comes down to, and this is what Kaylee will be leading us in this week. So he's like, you're so distracted, you're misunderstanding what love looks like. And so he is setting that right for them uh, because, because it is through a proper understanding of what love of God and love of others looks like uh, that we can clear the path uh, to be the church for each other uh, and, and, uh, and represent the character of God well to the world around us. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Kaylee in this continuation of our, of, of our look into Paul's letter to the Corinthians. As we prepare uh, to hear from her, we're gonna continue in worship. 
And we do so both uh, in the singing of songs and hymns to God, but then there's also tithe and offering, an opportunity to, to tangibly uh, worship God with the stuff of this world. Now, if you're a guest with us, uh, we want you to know that no one asked you to this service uh, for, your, for your money, for anything uh, that we want uh, from you. We hope that this service is received as a gift to you rather than anything else. We don't want you to feel pressure or expectation. I do hope that in this time, in this service, uh, that you'll consider what it is that God might wanna say to you today. Our hope is that you'll know how much you're, you're loved by your creator as a result of spending time in this space. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, who are partners or regular tenders here, you know why we give and why we call it worship. We give because we wanna be obedient uh, to God's word. We give because we're grateful for his provision and we train our hearts through our giving to, to recognize that God is ultimately our provider. And then we give because we want to make a difference in the world, right? It's the same reason we're going to do backpacks. It's the same reason uh, that we get out and serve and do care communities and all of that. We want to be involved in God's redemptive work in the world. And when we give to that, when we, when we leverage our resources for that, we know God can do more good with that than we can on our own. And we become worshipers in the act of surrendering that to God. So, as we continue to worship, let's worship our God in whom we find unity. Oh, 
my mystic body on Join us in one spirit join Let us still receive of thine Still for more on thee we call Thou who fillest all in If you're new with us today, let me quickly catch you up. We are spending a year in the book of Acts. We're looking at the very first church that was formed by the very first followers of Jesus. And how we do church has changed a lot since then, I think. So, so we're looking for some hints and wisdom that this first church can give us about how we, the modern church of today, ought to do life together in order to be the church that God created us to be for, for himself and for one another and for the world. In Acts 18, we learned about how Paul planted a church in Corinth on the Greek peninsula. And, uh, and we're looking at this letter right now that he wrote to the struggling young church as they started to encounter some challenges in life together. The Corinthians, they had written to Paul themselves, but he also started getting these kind of alarming reports about some of their behavior. And so he wrote back to them until he could get there to be with them in person. And, and this is the letter that we know as the book of 1 Corinthians. And so we've made a pit stop here. We're studying Acts, but we stopped here to listen in on Paul's guidance to this young church uh, as they're trying to figure out how to do life. Life together is hard. It's super hard, especially as Christians, we are supposed to be guided 
by self-sacrificial love of neighbor, even neighbors we don't like, even neighbors that we don't think are deserving, and that's very hard. But all of Paul's advice in this letter, if you've been tracking with us previous weeks, it all comes back to the same central message, which is that everything we do should build up the church. We may not feel like it, but it, it should, our actions should build up the church. Nothing we do should tear it down or should divide it. That's all of us. The church isn't just Summit. It's, it's every Christian in Orlando and in Florida and in our nation and in the world. We should always be building up this church. So, so we, we shouldn't engage in activities that, that hurt other people, hurt the believers around us, even, even if we have the right to do so. We shouldn't ever ask the question or only ask the question, you know, what's permitted for me? We should be asking the question, what's good? What's loving? Because those two things can be very, very different. So Paul has given the Corinthians some guidance on these key issues, five issues that we've been walking through over these, these, uh, this interlude, including divisions in the church. That was our first week. And then we talked about sex, food, worship, and resurrection. I think last week surprised us, right? The, the, the information on food. Paul says what's correct in terms of human behavior can actually change based on the circumstances. We don't want that. We want a formula. We want math. But Paul says, no, there's no formula. There's, there's a guiding principle. And that principle is love of God and love of neighbor. That is the lens through which you should view every relationship and every interaction. So this week, as we move on to, to our fourth key issue in consideration, which is how we ought to conduct ourselves uh, in worship gatherings. What are we supposed to, how are we supposed to behave when we do this thing that we call church? So we'll be covering material from chapters 11 through 14. We're going to dip our toe into 11, 12, and 14, but we're going to save 13 for last. We're going to skip it, come back to it, because that's where we'll be spending the bulk of our time today. If you're familiar with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you might know this as the love chapter. Love's a funny word. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think that it means what we think it means most of the time. I was on a plane once seated next to a British chap and it was an overnight flight. And uh, when the young American flight attendant came to ask us, did we want pillows or this or that? Uh, he says to her, thanks very much for that. Um, and also, can you be so kind as to knock me up about 7.30? And she was like, okay, and walked away. And I was very confused as well. And so finally I turned to him and I said, I'm sorry, did you, did you ask that flight attendant to knock you up? And he said, yes, at 7.30. And I said, I don't think that means what you think it means. <laughs> Words are important, right? And we have to understand what is meant by the person saying them before we can understand what it means for us. And these chapters, I think, perhaps even more so than the other chapters, demand, require us to be honest and disciplined in our study of the Bible. Remember, we are reading someone else's mail. And so to understand what it means for us, we have to understand what it first meant to the original audience. Great example of this is right off the bat here, at the beginning of chapter 11, Paul says, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But it is, if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. I have to tell you, we read these chapters together in the teach team. This is a room full of pastors. And even in a room full of pastors, we were like, uh, I don't know, what does that mean? Um, and we didn't know until we studied, until we were disciplined to look at the context to the original audience. We couldn't understand what it meant for us. And, and the original context is just this, the, the Corinthian church, it was smack in the middle of a, a thriving port city in first century Greece. I think Doug called it the Tatooine of, uh, of the first century. It was filled with colorful and shady characters of all kinds. It was filled with temples to, to Greco-Roman gods. And many of the women who worshiped in these temples, particularly the ones who worshiped in the cult of Dionysus or Sybil, would get into these emotional frenzies of worship where they would literally like whip their hair back and forth. And it was really distracting because in Corinth, the only other women who let their hair down, so to speak, were the temple prostitutes. And so Paul says, you know, when a woman prays or prophesies, by the way, that, that's when a woman prays or prophesies, not if. When a woman prays or prophesies, she should cover her head or it's gonna be a distraction to the other worshipers around her. So should I be wearing a bonnet for this uh, sermon? No, we have, to, we have to keep reading. Verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, 
It is her glory, for long hair is given to her as a covering. Ah, now it comes out. The word that Paul is using here for covering doesn't mean a bonnet or a veil. Those things wouldn't have been used in Corinth. What Paul means is that a woman should have her hair bound up. It shouldn't be loose. It should be bound up on top of her head. Literally, she should cover her hair. She should cover her head with her hair. Why? Because it was just hanging loose. That's very provocative. It can be very distracting uh, in a worship setting. Richard Hayes in his commentary says, loose unbound hair would be like if a woman got up today to pray in a bikini top. It would have been unnecessarily distracting to her fellow worshipers. Now, to be clear, it's within a woman's uh, Christian liberty to pray in a bikini shop at church if you know she feels so led. But I think Paul would ask her the same question that he's been asking us this whole series. I hope you know what it is by now, which is, does this build up the church? I mean, who are we trying to glorify here? Are you trying to point people's attention toward Jesus or to yourself? It's complicated, right? This is complicated stuff. We have to be honest. When we study the Bible, we have to be disciplined to understand, to 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 study, to understand what it meant first to its original audience before we understand what it means to us. Now, that, that doesn't mean that only smart people can understand the Bible. Absolutely not. But it does mean, and this is so important, it does mean that we need each other. We need, dare I say, in Paul's words, the other members of the body of Christ in order to really understand what God's word means to us more fully. And guys, that's not a design flaw. God doesn't want you to go out into the desert and just, you know, study the Bible in isolation from other people for years. I mean, that's, when we do that, that's when we get ourselves into a real pickle. You know, I, I'm only one part of the body, right? I'm, I'm just one part. And maybe I'm a brain. And maybe because I'm a brain, when I read the Bible, I, I think that I understand it best. And so I become proud and conceited like the Corinthians were. I look down on people who understand it less because that's what happens when I study the Bible alone, just a, a, a proud, lonely brain. But when I connect to the rest of the body, what happens? I discover things that I never would have by myself because I want, when I'm a brain reading alone, I'm reading the Bible with no heart. And how can I possibly understand God's word to his beloved children if I'm reading the Bible heartless? Verse 18, but in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Don't be a brain with no heart. We need each other. Also, and, and I think this is important to note, interestingly, in chapter 14, we'll skip, we'll skip down here to chapter 14 for a bit. It, it's clear in chapter 14, there's, no, there's not like a hierarchy in the way that Paul envisions the New Testament church gatherings. This, uh, this worship team that we have, the, the music that you heard in this speaker business, this is very kind of 2021. This is how church is right now, but it doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. I don't think it means it's the wrong way to do it. I think it means it's one of many possible right ways. Denominations, you know, I, I think at their best, I think they demonstrate diversity the beautiful diversity in the body of Christ and, and in how we can worship God, it, it, it's lovely. We don't all have to look like Summit. In fact, we shouldn't all look like Summit. And in the church that we're studying right now, these churches were, these were little cohorts meeting in people's houses. It didn't look anything like it does now. In chapter 14, verse 26, Paul says, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation. And, and he goes on with kind of, you know, more practical instruction on how to share those things in an orderly manner so it's not distracting. But the point is that he envisions a church where everyone is bringing something to the table. Everyone has a gift. Every member has a use. You are all empowered to enrich the body of Christ. That's what Paul is telling us here. So, so don't outsource it to other people like me. Take responsibility to use your gifts. If, if, this is a common message in 1 Corinthians. Take responsibility. If you've, not, if you've not heard that message yet, you probably haven't heard the previous weeks yet. Take responsibility and share your gifts. Not, of course, for your own glory, but, but yes, for the sake of others and service to others to build up the body of Christ in gratitude to God and for love of your neighbor. There is no useless body part, except the appendix. We covered that, but I told you none of you are appendices. You all have a responsibility to use your gifts to build up the body of Christ and to bring more of God's kingdom here to earth. You can't outsource that by tithing. 
Okay, so that's that's all context. We're not we're like not even in the sermon yet. We're going to be here all day. So so let's briefly look at, these, at, at all of these chapters. Chapter eleven, he talks about the head covering issue. We've already covered that. Uh, well, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, end of chapter eleven, he raises this issue of of communion, the Lord's Supper, when everyone comes together, who's a part of the, of the church for for a common meal in someone's home, uh, and and he. Paul uses the strongest possible language to rebuke the way that the Corinthians are doing communion, doing the Lord's Supper, because the wealthy Corinthians are having these extravagant meals. They, they're all kind of bringing their own food with them and, they, and they're eating these extravagant meals and some of them are getting drunk while the poorer Christians have nothing to eat. They have nothing because they're poor. They can't bring any food with them. And so one person is eating and getting drunk. Another one has nothing and Paul just lays into them about this. He says, you are making a farce of the Lord's Supper. I mean, communion, it's, remember it's supposed to be the great equalizer because all of us come to the communion table equally in need of the sustaining body and blood of Christ. None of us is any better. And so they're, they're supposed to share all the food in common because it's not just supposed to be, it's, all, it's not all metaphor. It's supposed to be an actual outworking of the unity of the body of Christ. It's not just supposed to represent it, it's supposed to do it. So they are supposed to, yes, be sharing their real physical food and their real physical drink as an act of unity in the body of Christ. And Paul says, you are doing the opposite of that. What you're doing, you, I would actually, I'd prefer you not do any of this than to do what you're currently doing because you are making the divisions even deeper. You're not closing them, you're making them worse. There is a lot more that I would love to say about that. And honestly, communion deserves its own dedicated sermon. And if you want that sermon, let me make you aware that Johnny Outing, preacher extraordinaire, is giving an excellent one live at Herndon today this week. So, uh, so if you want to lean in to that communion portion of the sermon, he leans heavily into chapter 11, please go and listen to that on the SoundCloud. You will not regret it. So that's chapter 11. When, when the church comes together for worship, Paul says, don't be provocative. Don't whip your hair back and forth. And also, uh, don't be greedy. Don't eat your extravagant meals in the presence of people who have nothing. You are supposed to be guided by love of God and love of neighbor. And so if you say that you love your neighbors, but this is how you behave, love does not mean what you think it means. If you say that you love and this is what it looks like, then love does not mean what you think it means. So moving on to chapter 12, Paul reminds them, you are all members of one body and that body, it's actually made better by you being different. Diversity is not like something that we just tolerate. Like it's, it's, it makes us better. The body is better because it has different parts. Remember, they, they all wanted to speak in tongues. They all wanted the gift of tongues because they, thought that they think that makes them wise and special and they have secret knowledge about God. And Paul, Paul says, guys, you, you, can, you, can't all, you can't all speak in tongues. <laughs> you can't all be tongues. We need different body parts. What a horror the body would be, he says. What a horror it would be if, if it was all just one giant tongue or you know, a giant brain or a giant eyeball, that's like something you'd find in a Jordan Peele film. It's terrifying. We need every part, each part, to, be, to do its function uh, and to be different in order to be a, a whole, functioning, healthy, beautiful body. So that leads us to chapter 13 where we will spend the rest of our time. This is the love chapter. No doubt you have heard this chapter read at weddings. Maybe you've seen parts of it embroidered on cushions. This is this lovely sentimental poem, this ode to treasure your love, to love, love is the reason we are gathered here and all of that. But my hope is that by the time I'm done with you today, you will never again think that chapter 13 is sentimental at all. And if it is right at your wedding, I hope it makes your palms sweaty. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Remember Paul has just ended chapter 12 by saying, you can't, you can't all have tongues, you can't be tongues. We have, we have to have different parts in the body, and so now I will show you the most excellent way. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse one. If I speak in the tongues of angels and of men, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. 
Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It is, it is beautiful, isn't it? It's like a poem. But remember, we have to be disciplined and honest in our study of the Bible, which means we may not take this chapter out of the context in which we find it. And so far in the letter, Paul, what, what has Paul said? He has accused them. He's accused them of foolishness, of intellectual pride, of greed, of arrogance. In other words, if you're guided by love of God and love of neighbor, and this is how you behave, again, love does not mean what you think it means. So chapter 13, it's not an intermission from those accusations. It is a point by point indictment. He is describing to them. He's taking the time to describe to them what love, what true love looks like not to make an ode to it sentimentally, but so that they know just how far they are from hitting the mark of actually loving one another, demonstrating true love to their neighbors. If I, if I speak in the tongues of angels and the tongues of men, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. They had theaters in Corinth, right? And uh, they didn't have sound systems like we do today. So they would use these huge bronze basins or gongs, they would call them, uh, to, to reverberate the voices of the actors. And then clanging cymbals, they would be used for sound effects, for lightning and stuff like that. Uh, so, so what's Paul saying here? He's saying if you, you know, you, you might be gifted in the secret language of the angels, but if, if you use those gifts just to puff yourself up, to prop yourself up in status instead of building up the church, then you are no better than an actor. You're playing the part of a good Christian, but it's, it's an act. It's theater because that's, that's all spiritual talent is when it is not motivated by love. Verse two, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Remember chapter three, the, wi the wisdom that they're obsessed with. You could, he says, you can have all the worldly wisdom that there is in the universe, but it is nothing compared to the wisdom of God. And, and God's wisdom says, love one another. He says, He'll, you'll, they'll, they'll know that you're my disciples, not if you're gifted, but if you love one another, not if you're smartest, but if you love one another. Verse three, if I, if I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. I, I wonder if you'll remember back in Acts 5, there was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira, and they sold all of their property to give the money to the poor, um, and, and, but they kept a little bit for themselves. And, and that's not even the thing that God took issue with. He didn't care. About, what he cared about was the fact that they lied and said, no, we gave it all. We gave every cent of that to the poor. Why? Because they wanted all of the glory, but not quite all of the sacrifice. They wanted to boast. It wasn't motivated by love and indeed they gained nothing. Verse five, it is not self-seeking. That's a dig, I think, directly about the lawsuits that we talked about in chapter six, these rich Christians taking the poor Christians to court because they think um, the, the courts will act in their favor because their buddies are the judges. They, that, that is self-seeking at its peak, I think. Verse six, love does not delight in evil. In other words, when you came to understand the truth about Jesus Christ and your freedom in his grace and forgiveness, I hope you didn't say, yes, now I can sin all I want and God will let me off the hook, ha ha ha. No, that's delighting in evil. Love does not delight in evil. 
It rejoices with the truth. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. This, this little section, it is my favorite part of, the, of this chapter because this is Paul's masterful rhetoric and reasoning at its very best. He is taking their weapon of wisdom and using it against them. He's, he's turning it right, right back around and he's saying, okay, you Corinthians, you, you love to be praised, right? You want to be the smartest and most gifted in the room, right? You, you, that's why you worship wisdom. That's, that's why you uh, want the gift of tongues, right? So that you can be special and set apart. That's why you want to prophesy. He says, you're like children. You're like children trying to show off the shiniest, newest toy, but you forget, you forget that when Jesus comes back to the playroom, when he returns to us, none of those gifts will be useful anymore. You will no longer be gifted. Jesus is, he's coming back for us. This is called the perusia, the second coming of Christ and, and, and prophecy and, and, and tongues. They can only hint at it. Right, they only tell us part of the story. We, we, the Bible says we see through a glass dimly. We can't see everything that's coming. And Paul says once Jesus is back, once he is actually in front of us, none of you will be gifted anymore because prophecy and tongues can only give glimpses of a God that one day we will see clearly face to face. When Jesus returns, God will be revealed completely to us. We will know him face to face. It won't be through a glass dimly. It will be clear as day, which means your gifts will become useless. Even faith and hope, he says, will become obsolete. Because what are, those are, those are, you know, faith is hope and things not yet seen, but we're gonna see God someday. And when we do, we won't need hope or faith because we'll finally see him. He'll be right there with us. You, 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 you silly Corinthians, he says. You guys are killing me. You, you are working so hard to try to be the most gifted and the most special, but when Jesus is back, you're gonna be out of a job. You're gonna be selling yesterday's newspapers with all your tongues and prophecy, but love, love is a skill that will always be employed. Love is a skill that will still be useful in heaven. And those precious few saints who choose to practice love as their primary calling, they will be the master and you will be the apprentice. So stop being babies and stop trying to outshine each other or outdo each other with your fancy gifts. Or do you want to be, do you want to be unemployed in heaven? Let's not. And then he, uh, he, he twists the knife. He get back, jump back to 14. He twists the knife, which he has done, I feel like throughout this book, uh, chapter 14, verse 18, in Paul fashion. I thank God that I speak tongues more than any of you. He, it's like he pulls the rug right out from under him. He's like, you know, you think you're so special? I, I speak more tongues than all y'all. But guess what? I don't do it in church. I don't do it in church. He says, I would rather speak five intelligible words that could help benefit the whole church than to speak 10,000 words that only angels understand. Hmm. So no, chapter 13 is not sentimental. It is an indictment. It is 13 hard verses full of all the ways that we still have to grow up and stop being children. If you guys claim to be guided by love and this is how you behave, then love does not mean what you think it means because it is not a feeling, it's an action. It is a steady, determined, self-sacrificing love of neighbor that keeps on serving, even when we don't feel like it. So stick that in your wedding pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to ruin it for weddings. I think it's beautiful. I really do. I, I just want us to understand it. And I don't think that Paul yelled at them for 12 straight chapters, just a wax rhapsodic and lucky 13. We, we would do well to, to, we would absolutely do well to model our weddings after this chapter, but only especially if we understand what it's actually calling us to. So to sum up Paul's message in these four chapters, it's the same message that he keeps coming back to. 
build up the body of Christ. Everything we do, every interaction should build up. Even our spiritual gifts we should use to build up the church. It should unite us. It should not divide us. It should not make us feel superior. It shouldn't alienate the people that we deem less worthy. So I hope, as a point of application, I hope you do use your gifts to build up this body of Christ. I really hope you do. I hope you take the time to develop them and to hone them and to get excellent at them. And I hope you use them to build up the body. And if you're curious about what using your gifts to build up the body of Christ might look like, I don't, Paul didn't give me all the details, but, but I can tell you that it will look like being patient and being kind and not envying or boasting. It will look like not being proud or rude or self-seeking or easily angered on Facebook. It will look like not keeping a record of wrongs. It won't delight in other people's failures even when they deserve them. It will always trust, always protect, always hope. It will always persevere. And if that seems like an impossible task to do anything, any job with that level of integrity and character and selfless love, you're right, it is impossible. It's absolutely impossible. If it weren't, we would not need a savior to give us the strength to do it. We've got to use our gifts. You have to use your gifts because you might, you don't know, you might be a leg and without you, the church will always be limping. You must use your gifts to build up the body of Christ. And with God's help, you will be able to use them in a way that, it all, that is always guided by selfless love. Because if it's not, it's just theater. And nobody acts their way to heaven, no matter how talented they might be on earth. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that in your wisdom, you gave us great diversity. Thank you that we don't all have the same gifts. Thank you that we're not just one giant tongue or eyeball or brain. Thank you that in your wisdom, you saw fit to make us different and wonderful and beautiful together, that each of us complements the other and that all of us reflect your glory more than any one of us could alone. Lord, would you help us to live out of that reality? Would you help us to embrace the diversity of the church, the diversity of the giftedness within that church, would you strip us of any pride that we have about our specific talent and would you give us confidence if we think our talent is not something to be proud of? Lord, we are equal at the foot of your cross. You need every one of us. You want every one of us and we all need each other. And so I pray that you would be kind and tender to the people today who, who don't think that they have anything useful to give. They do, you know they do. Would you help them find out what it is? Would you be near to them and kind to them and merciful to them and build up their confidence? And for those of us who think that we are just a little too talented, would you strip us of our pride? Would you give us the mercy of humility so we can see that yes, we are useful, but we're only one part. We can't run the whole show and we shouldn't. Lord, I pray that this week that you would help each person find the way that you've, that you've gifted them, that you've asked them to build into this body. And I hope you would help us to remember that in the moments that we're just not sure what that looks like, we can rely on the fact that love is enough of a skill for any of us. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we put our hope. Amen.
each other we will work side by side we will work with each other we will work side by side and we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride and they'll know we are christians by So faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I'll tell you, the, the idea that love will be our occupation for eternity and all of the other things uh, will, get, will get peeled away, will get transformed, and, and, and love is the center of, uh, of our identity, that, that ought to move us uh, to be better um, at loving each other. That ought to move us to, uh, to, to filter our relationships with, it, with the question of, uh, of are we loving God in this and are we loving the people around us? It is so easy to get distracted uh, from that, both as, as the center of, of our relationship with God and, and the center of what he calls us to for the world around us. So let's take that idea that we, that we are made uh, to grow and to communicate and to live in love. Let's take that with us through the week and see how God transforms us as a result because we only become good in, in, in showing God's love to others to the extent that we are able to receive it from him as well. With that in mind, hear these words of blessing and benediction as we close our time together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in God's peace. This service is ended. <laughs>